this is the second video in the regression series and it's going to be focusing on multiple regression. This video is just going to be talking about a standard multiple regression as there are many different methods of doing multiple regression and a video going over all of them will take literally hours. So this is, I'm just going to be discussing the most used methods and how to interpret the results that you get in SPSS. So, in the last video we discussed how two variables can influence each other and how one can lead to another, or and how one can predict the outcome of another variable. But it may have struck you that the social world is not typically composed of simple bivariate relationships, and that a method that examines only bivariate relationships is rather simplistic. Behavioral and social phenomena are determined by many different factors and they, these factors work in multiple interacting patterns and generally we can get a better understanding of these relationships involved if we use analytic techniques that take this diverse relationship into account. The general purpose of multiple regression, which was first used by Pearson in 1908, all manually calculated is to learn more about the relationship between several independent or predictive variables and one dependent or criterion variable. As I said before, there are a number of multivariate procedures that are useful for the purposes of modeling complex phenomena and relationships. However, the most important of these, as it is pretty much the building block of all others, is the multiple linear regression. And once you understand multiple linear regression, it's easier to understand the other techniques or the more complex techniques that are related to it in some way. Remember that the standard error in a linear regression tells us approximately how much on average regression predictions differ from the observed values. For example, let's say an educational psychologist may want to know which variables influence a student's university exam results and after reading the literature he finds that the variables of hours spent studying, overall anxiety levels and their A point scores all theoretically influence their exam results. So we would end up having an, a regression equation that looks something like y equals a plus b1 x1 plus b2 x2 plus b3 x3 plus the, the residual score. If we agree to assign the notation of x1 to hours spent revising, x2 to overall anxiety, and x3 to A point score, then we could say that B1 is the regression slope or slope coefficient associated with x1, B2 is the regression or slope coefficient associated with x2, and B3 is the slope or regression coefficient associated with x3. Another way of saying this is that the regression coefficient of each variable represents the unique contribution of that variable to the prediction equation, or the contribution of the variable after partialing out the contributions of all other independent variables. While a is the intercept term and omega is the residual term. Multiple regression pretty much allows us to find a linear combination of independent variables that optimally predicts or explains a dependent variable, which in this example we're working with would be their entrance exam score. From this we can gorge the relative contribution of the different variables in the combination and we can use the combination or the equation as an actuarial device that we can use to predict a value on the dependent variable for a particular combination of data on the independent variable. So just to talk about the assumptions, the primary assumptions again are the same as in basic linear regression in that there needs to be a linear relationship between the variables and the, there needs to be a normal distribution of the residuals. However, again, the normal, normal distribution of the residuals is less important as the sample size increases. What differentiates multiple regression from uh, 
basic linear regression is of course that it has two or more independent variables, which in this case can be continuous or categorical. And importantly, your data must not show multicollinearity. Multicollinearity occurs when you have two or more independent variables that are highly correlated with each other. And this leads to a problem with understanding which independent variable contributes to the variance explained in the dependent variable. Two variables become re redundant when they have a very high multicollinearity value, and you don't know which one is affecting the relationship of the predictor. If two variables have a, a correlation value of 0 0.9 or above, you should be cautious about the level of collinearity within this model. Okay, so now that we've got the conceptual stuff out the way, let's proceed with actually performing the analysis and interpreting the results. Okay, so here we have our data set of the example that I've been talking about this video. We have the student, um, we have the student exam entry scores as our dependent variable and we have three predictor variables or independent variables which we're going to input into our linear regression analysis. Note that all of the all of these um, all of these variables are paired as well as multivariate which is necessary for linear regression analysis. So if you want to know what those terms mean check out the previous video on basic linear regression and I do explain it over there. Okay, so we can see that all of our variables are continuous, i.e. they're not categorical, and we can proceed to the analysis. Even though you can use categorical variables as a predictive variable in multiple linear regression, I uh, don't have any in this example, but you can use them. However, if you have three or more categories, you have to create dummy variables, which is unnecessary complicated. I always do prefer to use continuous data if I can. Okay, so we would go to regression or analyze regression linear and we would enter exam score in our dependent variable box because that is what we're trying to predict using the predictors of hours spent revising, anxiety and A-level entry points. So for the statistics we can have our estimates, confidence intervals are fine it's good for reporting them. We need to have our covariance matrix to determine if um, linearity between the variables or the dependent variable and the independent variables. We can have our model fit. Let's see how significant the model is. R squared change is not really necessary in the enter method, which we're doing now, because all of the variables would just be entered in no matter how significant they are. So we don't really need R squared change in this example as that pretty much is only used for stepwise methods where you put different variables in and SPSS chooses the most significant and most contributing independent variables that contribute to that predictor. But as we use an enter method, it just pretty much forces all of the variables we enter to be in that model regardless of their individual significance. Descriptive is always useful and part and partial correlations and collinearity di diagnostics not so important for uh, an enter method but I will just dis discuss them anyway so you can know what they are and we can click continue plots in the previous video I showed a different way of doing it where you can save the the residuals and then plot the in this example you can just put in the y column or the y axis rather the standardized residuals or the standardized predicted scores as well as the standardized residuals and this will create a scatter plot and if you want to have the normality probability plot you can click that little button over there and it will generate it so it saves you one step and then again if you want to save your residuals you can click save and then click standardized predicted values and standardized residuals but in this case I don't really need to do that so I'm just not going to and as I said, we're going to be starting off with the enter method where all of the variables or all of the independent variables that you enter are pretty much forced into the model that's generated as opposed to stepwise where the model chooses the most significant and most contributing variables to that predictor. So 
And that's pretty much it for the setup, so we can click OK. Here we have our descriptive statistics, but more importantly we have our correlation matrix. We can see that all of the independent variables do have a linear relationship with the overall exam score, which is good as it's an assumption that needs to be met. And we can also see that the independent variables do have a correlation with each other or relationship with each other but they're not above 0 0.9 so it shouldn't influence the assumption of multicollinearity too much but we can double check that later as well so variables entered and removed as we're using the enter method all of the variables would be forced into the model and none would be removed so there would only be one model in a stepwise regression method you would have multiple models depending on which depending on how um, SPSS rates the significance of all those individual variables. In the model summary we can see R which is the multiple correlation coefficient and is the correlation between the predicted values and the observed values so we can see that's pretty high so that's always good and the adjusted R squared is the it tells us the amount of variance that the independent variables account for in the overall outcome variable. So we can say that the three variables of um, what was it? anxiety, hours spent revising, and A-level entry points account for 83.4% of the total variance of the exam score. The ANOVA that just tells us that our model is statistically significant and here are our coefficients which we can use to build our prediction equation or actuarial device. So as I said, B, you can't really determine, these are unstandardized coefficients, so you can't really determine which one of these has more importance than the other as they're all based on different measurement levels. However, if we go to the standardized coefficients, we can tell the relative importance of the different variables. So we can say that A-level entry points is more relevant than anxiety to getting a higher exam score. But we'll come to completing the equation in a bit. Let's have a look at the collinearity statistics. So tolerance, if tolerance is below 0 0.11 then you don't really have a lot of tolerance against multicollinearity. If they're above 0 0.11, like our, all of ours are, then we can safely assume that collinearity is not an issue in this data set. And to confirm that, we can look at the VIF, which stands for the Variance Inflation Factor. If the VIF is above 10, then we can, then we can assume that multicollinearity is a problem in this data set. But these are all quite well below 10, and so we can safely progress with our interpretation of the model without worrying that that's, that assumption has been violated. So here we see the zero order correlations, which is the default correlations. You'll see that these values correspond with our matrix up here. Our partial correlations, these indicate the unique contribution of an independent variable. And these are generally used in stepwise regression to determine which values should be included in the model. So obviously you want variables with a lot of individual and unique contribution to the dependent variable, otherwise they will just become redundant. So now we can look at our charts which were produced, to, which we should have done earlier really, but this is just an example. But note, check your assumptions first, otherwise any of your interpretation may well just be for naught. See so how we can see our normal PP plot of the standardized residuals, so the predicted values or standardized predicted values against the standardized residuals. The closer the data points are to this line, which are they're pretty close, the higher the normality or the greater the normality of the residuals. So we can see that this is quite close to it and so we can safely progress knowing that the assumption of normality of the res residuals has been met. So if we look at the scatter plot of the residuals versus the predicted scores or the predicted values, if the distribution is roughly of a rectangular shape or rectangular distribution, 
then we can say that the the l assumption of linearity has been met with most of the data items clustered in the middle which they kind of are it's if you have a bigger data set you would see it more clearly we can safely continue with the assumption of linearity being met in addition to looking at the correlation matrix so we can continue with our interpretation now that we know for sure that the assumptions that are required have been met we can build our regression equation so for our equation of y equals a plus b1 x1 plus b2 x2 plus b3 x3 we can know that a is the intercept which is the constant value here and we don't use the standardized coefficients to in our equation but rather the original units in which they are measured in so the unstandardized equation or unstandardized coefficients so we would have a of 11 negative 11.823 <coughs> plus 0 0.551 times the unit of the hour spent revising plus 0 0.104 times the level of anxiety plus 1.989 times the A-level entry points. So the equation would look a bit like this. And then once we have this equation set out, then we can determine what an individual's or what an individual in this data set exam score would be if we had all those units of measurement. The thing about multiple regression is that you can't really generalize it beyond the data set that you're using so it does have limitations. So next I just briefly want to show you how to interpret uh, or how to perform and interpret a stepwise method. So basically we're going to leave this all exactly the same and then change the method stepwise and click OK. So the correlation is all exactly the same but here variables entered and removed. The variables entered first of all would be A level entry points and that's model 1 and then the second model would be when they enter our spent revising as well. And we can tell here the model summary. If it's just A level entry points there's a multiple correlation coefficient of 8.72 and adjusts our square of 0.746. If we add our spent revising into the model, that R score increases as well as the adjusted R square score. And the standard error of estimate decreases. Looking at our ANOVA model summary, we can see that both models are statistically significant. But if they're both statistically significant and one has a higher adjusted R squared value, you should probably go with the model that has the higher level of variance accounted for. So this is just our coefficients again for the different models. And in this box here we can see the excluded variables. So in the first model, our spent revising and anxiety were excluded. And in the second model, it was just anxiety that was excluded as the overall significance was below significant or the overall value of that significance value was not very high. So SPSS decided to exclude the anxiety score because it was not as significant and didn't account for as much variation as the other variables. And that's it for this video. I hope it was useful. Like and subscribe if it was.